uh, another psalm. Well, we're not going to cover the whole psalm. Uh, we're only going to cover Psalms one, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3 of uh, Psalm 40. So uh, if you got your Bible or got your cell phone with a Bible app, <laughs> turn there, if you will, and we're going we're gonna to look at that today. Okay. Of course, Pastor Herrick always has his opening joke. One thing that makes a joke funny is an unexpected line at the end, punchline. And that's what this one had. I had to laugh at this when I read that, so I says, I'm going to put that in a sermon. Okay, here it is, people. It says, I was visiting my daughter last night when I asked if I could borrow a newspaper. This is the 21st century, she says. We don't waste money on newspapers. Here's my iPad, okay? I can tell you. That fly never knew what hit him. <laughs> I don't know if the iPad was still good, but that fly never knew what hit him. Huh? <laughs> Newspapers had more than one use when we used to get the newspaper. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's get into Psalm 40. I said... Here we go. Introduction to this psalm. Interesting psalm. If, as you, if we were to cover the whole thing, this introduction is going to talk about the whole psalm. Um, psalm 40 is a song about the pits. Yeah, being in the pits. We have uh, made that kind of an expression. Well, I'm in the pits, you know. Well, this is literally is a psalm about being in the pits. It falls into two sections. The first section, verses 1 through 10, and as I said, we're not going to cover the whole thing today, um, but... David, David's the author of it, he tells how God got him out of one pit that he was in, past tense, you'll notice those first ten verses, out of one pit, and he sings God's praise for doing so. Then as you go on in the psalm, the second part, uh, but he did not then live happily ever after. Rather, it is evident from the second half of the psalm, verses 11 through 17, that he is now in another pit, and he is crying out to God for help while he is in that one, asking God to deliver him from that second pit that he is now in. So kind of interesting, but um, because David waited patiently, and we're going to emphasize that today, because David waited intently on the Lord to rescue him from the first pit, he knew how to wait on the Lord to get him out of the second pit. We learn from those experiences that God helps us through. Then when we go through them again, we can think back, oh yeah, God helped me with that one. And we can learn from that. So this is a psalm about what you do when you are in a pit. All right. All right, so here's, my, uh, here's the text. We're going to read the three verses, uh, well-known passages. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. What a wonderful, what a wonderful passage here. Psalm 40, memorized and loved by many people. Many songs, Dan was finding that out, have been written about these passages. Here's my outline. Um, remember the P's. I hope you got an outline off the table out there. I got seven points. Seven points! Yeah, we'll make it through. Seven points, and each one begins with a P. The pit of destruction, the prayer of dependency, the patient waiting, the power of the Lord, the per, uh, petrified platform, I had to come up with a P, and you don't know, he set my feet upon a rock, uh, petrified, get it? So I had to come up, that's the only P I could find there. Petrified platform, the praise of a new song, and the people listening. Huh? There's a nice seven-point outline that we're going to work our way through. I know, you are busy trying to fill out my outline sheet, but we'll hit these one at a time, so you get it. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Actually, we're not going to start at the beginning. 
We're going to start on verse 2, the pit of destruction. First part of verse 2, it says, He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. Okay, the pit, right? What is a pit? Well, in the Bible, a pit denotes, obviously, you kind of understand this, just like we have today, digging a pit. Not a cherry pit, but a pit that is a hole dug in the ground denotes a large hole in the ground, okay? But they, we see these in Bible times. They were outdoor people. They were among the mountains and the rocks, and there were a lot of pits. Pits were used to catch wild animals. Ezekiel 19 has a passage talking about that. Or to collect water for drinking, called a cistern. Those were large holes in the rock and the water would get in there and they would collect the water and they would be able to to collect uh, drinking water from the cisterns. But sometimes they were used as dungeons or prisons. Now Genesis 37, anyone remember about, think about your Bible, Genesis, near the end of Genesis 37, who was thrown in a pit? Joseph's brothers threw him in a pit. Yeah. Did you ever read the book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah 38, the people didn't like what Jeremiah was prophesying, so they threw him into a pit. So there are several instances where these people were literally, they were literally thrown into a pit. Okay? So you say, okay, so what's so bad about being thrown into a pit? Well, I want three truths you need to realize about a pit, okay? Number one, people do not go into them on purpose. Oh, here's a pit. I think I'll jump down in there and see what's in this pit. I don't have a ladder. I don't have a rope, but I think I'll jump down into this pit. People don't go into them on purpose. Okay? They accidentally fall into them or they are put in there by their enemies. Okay? So that's the first point. David was in a pit. Maybe his enemies put him in there. Maybe, maybe it was uh, other things. He accidentally fell in there. Secondly, usually the conditions in the bottom of that pit are not pleasant. There's, there might be some water, but it's probably pretty muddy. There's not any food unless an animal accidentally falls into that pit as well. And it's not a very nice place to live. In fact, he calls it, in this psalm, he calls it a pit of mire, or another, uh, a less poetic term for mire is mud. Okay, there's all kinds of slippery, slimy, thick, uh, quicksand type of mud at the bottom of this pit. So he fell into this pit or was put in there by his enemies. He's at the bottom. He's all full of mud. It isn't a very pleasant condition to be in. And thirdly, here's the important thing to realize about a pit. The sides of a pit are too high to get out by yourself without help. You're going to stay in that pit unless somebody comes along, drops a ladder, drops a rope down, and helps you out of the pit. You're going to stay into that pit until you starve to death, until you die, okay? Those are three important truths about a pit. Okay, now you're saying, wait a minute, are you telling me that David's writing, he was walking through the mountains and he literally fell into a pit, and this is a psalm about that? Well, no. But David uses the illustration of falling into a pit, being in a pit with miry clay, figuratively because of things that were going on in his life. He seems to be in some kind of difficult circumstances. We don't know what they were. We don't know the context of this psalm. Could it be when Saul was chasing him around? We, we don't know. But David somehow... Uh, at least in the past, when he's writing this, these first three verses are in the past because the Lord's already got him out of the pit. Later on, he's in another pit seeking the Lord's help again. But we don't know what the circumstances of that pit were, but they were difficult circumstances. Sometimes, people, circumstances come into our life and it feels like we are in a pit. There, it, we... we in and of ourselves cannot get out of them. And they are difficult, unpleasant circumstances to go through. Remember those three truths that we just 
just talked about. It's unpleasant to be in them, and getting out of them is going to be impossible by ourselves. Either his enemies put uh, him in these circumstances, or they came on him by accident. David was powerless in and of himself to get out of these circumstances. Have you ever had unpleasant circumstances in your life that you had no control of and by yourself, of your own power, you could not get out of them? The problem is when we are in those circumstances, we often keep trying to get out of them ourselves. David realized that there was no way he could do it by himself, so he looked to the Lord. Okay, a pit. Secondly, when he was in there, he knew he couldn't get out by himself, so he did the only thing possible. He prayed, okay? Uh, prayer of dependency. Notice I started in verse 2. Now I'm backing up to the second part of verse 1. He says in 1b, second part of verse 1, he says, he inclined, talking about God, inclined to me and heard my cry. God heard David's cry and inclined himself to David, okay? A couple of things that I want you to see here. Two words that are used here. First of all is the word, my battery I think is running low. There we are. First word David uses here is the word cry. David was praying, and I don't think David's prayer went like this. Oh, Lord, I guess I need your help. Uh, if, if you get around to it, Lord, I'd appreciate it if you'd kind of help me out of my pit here. I don't think David's prayer was like that. The word cry implies desperation. The word cry implies that he was pleading with the Lord. You know, we are so emotionless in our prayer life. All right, let's gather around. We're going to have some food. Let's pray together. Lord, bless this food in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, like you really, you really were thankful to the Lord for that food and you wanted the Lord to bless it. No. You know what they call that? They call that ritualism. When we pray without emotion in our prayer, it is merely ritualism. And we fall into that. I find myself, when I have my prayer time in the morning, I've gone through my daily devotions, I've read some scripture, and then I, then I say, okay, now I'm at some time to prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this day. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, <laughs> what I mean by that is, Lord, I don't want to go through any hard times. Just make my day as easy as possible. You know, that's my, that's my prayer. Lord, bless this day, you know. But it takes difficult circumstances to get our emotions involved in our prayer life, doesn't it? When we are, everything's going fine, our prayer life is emotionless. But when things are tough and we're in the pits, when we're in a circumstance that we can do nothing about, that's when we cry unto the Lord. We need to have emotions in our prayer life. If you have some unsaved relatives, you need to be crying out to the Lord for their lives. If you have some difficult circumstances, you need to be crying out to the Lord to help you, to help you in those circumstances. So the first word I want you to notice in that verse, David cried to the Lord. The second word I want you to notice, inclined. Okay, here's God. Now, if God was, I'm going to kind of humanize God. God's up there in heaven, having a good time, keeping the universe together, you know, and then there's this world. What's the population of the world? I don't know. Okay, all right, lots of people, lots of people. And a lot of them are Christians. And a lot of them, right, well, many of them are Christians. And many of them are, are praying to the Lord. Now, what if Dan over there gets up tomorrow morning, Six o'clock, right? You get up early. <laughs> Pastor Eric gets up six o'clock in the morning. And both of us sit down. We have our devotions at the same time. And he's at his house and I'm at my house. And, and we both start our prayer at the same time. And Dan says, Lord, bless this day. And Pastor Eric says, Lord, bless this day. 
And, and God's sitting up there and saying, huh? Oh, wait a minute. I'm getting this confused. Wait a minute. Who's praying what? What's going on? That isn't what goes on, is it? God has the ability to hear all of our prayers and work out the circumstances that he inclines to us. I said here, the creator God of the universe looks down, he hears your prayer, and he has concern enough to answer your prayer. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? The God of this universe who is busy holding Jupiter's ring. No, that's Saturn. Saturn's rings together, keeping the moons of Jupiter flying around them, keeping the sun burning and all of the stars out there. He's busy doing all of that, and yet he hears our prayer and is willing to incline to us and help us in our circumstance. In fact, that's what he wanted. God is saying, David, I wanted you to be dependent on me, to look to me in this circumstance so that I could come and help you and prove my faithfulness and my strength. God inclined and heard David's prayer and answered him. All right, now, Let's go backwards again. Point three, patient waiting. Verse one. Now, in this interesting, well, here's the here's verse. In this one, interesting. He did not start out and say, I was in a pit, and then I prayed, and then I waited patiently. That's not the order that this psalm comes. The waiting patiently is at the beginning. He says, verse 1, I waited patiently to the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and he heard to me and he heard my cry. And it goes on from there. He put this first. Why? Because I think this was the point that David wanted to emphasize in this psalm. I'm in a pit, circumstances that I cannot get out of myself. I went to the Lord, I cried to the Lord, and then I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. We don't like that. When, when we pray, Lord, these circumstances are unpleasant. I don't like being in this pit of miry clay. I want out, and I want out now. You know, it's kind of like when I'm sitting there watching the Tigers playing with my feet up on, I'm on the couch, and I say, woman, I want a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, you know Laura well enough that that doesn't go over so well. <laughs> if she happened to be in the kitchen and wasn't working on her own stuff or doing something, she might get me that, you know, you know, but that don't, that don't, that, it isn't an instantaneous thing, you know. Well, same thing here. David prayed, and then David waited. It doesn't tell us how long he waited, but he patiently waited for the Lord. Very interesting, you get into the original language. The Hebrew word that's used here, it's translated, uh, waited patiently, okay, like there were two Hebrew words, and there are two Hebrew words. The Hebrew words used here are kavat, kaviti. Aren't that, that kind of neat? Aren't those kind of neat? Kavat, kaviti. Now, if you look at those two words, kavat, kaviti, you notice something about them. They're kind of similar to each other, aren't they? Well, here's something you need to realize about Hebrew. Yeah, my dad, batteries there. Okay, Hebrew has no vowels in their words for pronunciation. Okay, all they had was consonants. It was uh, 6th century B.C. when the Masoretes put vowel pointing. They put little dots under the various letters so that they would, uh, some of their kids weren't remembering how to pronounce all the Hebrew words, so they put little dots under the letters to help them remember how to, how to pronounce them. But also to help them realize how that word was used in the Hebrew sentence. Okay, in English, we have a sentence. If I say this, Dan is patient. Oh, you, uh, Dan's my guinea pig this morning. Okay, if I say Dan is patient, Dan is a noun, P 
patient is an adjective. Adjectives are words that, that modify, describe a noun. Okay? But if I say this, Dan waited patiently. I have modified that word patient just a little bit by putting an L-Y on the end of it, and it changes it. Dan isn't patient anymore, but the verb waited is modified by the adverb. Difference between an adjective and an adverb, going back to your eighth grade English class. huh? We've modified patient a little bit by adding an L-Y. Well, Hebrew does the same thing. They might use um, different vowel pointings to tell you how that word is used in the sentence, okay? So here, kind of interesting, yeah, only to show how the word is used, so that this basically is repeating the same word twice. Kavat, kaviti, means I waited. Literally, very literally, you could translate it, I waited waitingly. <laughs> that, that don't come across in English very well, but that literally in the Hebrew, that's literally what it is. I waited waitingly. Well, if you got an adverb, waitingly, how's that going to come over into English? Patiently. I prayed, and then I waited for the Lord to answer me. I waited patiently for the Lord to answer God came to Abraham. Before he was Abraham, before he was Abraham, he was Abram. Remember, God changed his name. And the Lord said, and they were elderly, he, both he and his wife, Sarah, who at that point, her name was Sarai. God said, Abraham, your wife is going to get pregnant, and the child you have is going to be growing to a great nation and eventually the Messiah is going to come out of that seed of your wife. Well, Abraham heard the Lord's promise. And then the Lord left, and Abraham began to think, oh, but my wife is real old. How, how in the world is this going to be promised? So Abraham began scheming. And if you read the story, it was actually Sarah who began scheming. And Sarah says, okay, Abraham, I can't have kids anymore. Take my handmaid as your concubine and have a child through her, and then that will fulfill the Lord's promise. That child will become the great seed, like the Lord promised. So Abraham said, okay, dear. And uh, he did what his wife said, and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, who was not that special seed that was going to grow into the great nation. In fact, the Ishmaelites became enemies of Israel throughout the whole Old Testament and caused all kinds of problems. Why? Because Abraham couldn't sit back and wait for the Lord to answer what he had promised. That becomes so difficult for us. We try to scheme and we try to get it out of our get out of it ourselves. We try to get out of that pit. We jump and jump and jump and jump. Oh, I was only, I, I, that time I jumped, I was only three feet from the top. I almost made it out of the pit. Yeah, you know, we keep trying to, maybe if I pile some mud up at the bottom, I can stand on that and get out of this horrible pit. You know, you step on that mud and all you do, yeah. we keep trying. David didn't. David waited for the Lord now, that don't mean we sit back and just do nothing and say, okay, no, responsibility is off me. I don't have to do anything now. David was still faithful. David was trusting the Lord. But in this pit he was in, whatever those circumstances were, he waited patiently for the, an the Lord to answer that. So while waiting, I was waiting. That's a strong sense there. Okay. Other reference, waiting is important. We find that throughout the Old Testament. We find it all kinds of times in the Psalms. Psalm 25, verse 21. May integrity and, uprights preserve, and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Okay? So he is asking the Lord to protect him. Why? Because he is waiting. Waiting on the Lord is an important quality the Lord wants in our lives. Psalm 27, 14. 
Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Um, do you ever have to tell wives, do you ever have to tell your husband twice to do something? Moms, do you ever have to tell your husband or your kids twice to do something? Yeah, yeah. That, that puts an emphasis on there because they're not doing it. The psalmist here says, wait for the Lord. Be strong, let your heart in. And then he says, wait for the Lord. I said it before, but I got to say it again. Why do I got to repeat myself? Wait for the Lord. Important quality the Lord wants for us to have. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and I, in his word, I hope. We find it all over the place. Of course, the well-known verse, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Yeah, many of you had that one memorized. But they who wait for the Lord, there it is, wait for the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting on the Lord. David waited on the Lord. God's timing. John 11. God's timing is always right. We want it now. God does it in his timing. This is interesting. John 11, verses 5 through 7. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Okay, this is in the passage where Lazarus is sick. Okay, Jesus loved them. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, now, he immediately went to Bethany and healed his sickness. That isn't what it says. He loved them. So what did he do? He waited two more days. Isn't it? Ah. Uh, then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. God's timing. He had to wait for Lazarus to die so that Lazarus could be resurrected again. God's timing is perfect. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God through the centuries, everyone was waiting for that coming Messiah, the seed of the woman, all the way back from Genesis 3, 16. The seed of the woman, the promised Messiah was going to come and redeem mankind. But we had to wait centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. And finally... When the fullness of time had come, when it was just the right time, God had worked the world's circumstances out. There was the Greek culture. There was the Roman uh, governing. It was just the right time. God sent his son. God's timing is always right. When we are in those, here, here's the application. When we are in those pits, when those circumstances are around us and they are unpleasant and we cry out to the Lord, we need to trust in the Lord and wait patiently for his answer. Continue to live a faithful Christian life, doing the things we're supposed to be doing, but trusting that the Lord is going to answer, even if it don't come today or tomorrow or next week. Keep trusting that the Lord will answer. All right, I need to move along here. This was on our Daily Bread this week on Facebook. God's timing is always right. Wait patiently for him. Now, I thought that was interesting. I was preaching on this this week, and then it was, in the, it was in the Daily Bread this week. All right, power of the Lord. He drew me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. Okay, David's down there, can't get out. And God heard his prayer, and it doesn't tell us how much time went by. But in God's timing, God says, okay, David, I think you have been in there long enough. You've learned your lesson. Now I'm going to come. Just like somebody that's in a pit and they're crying, help, somebody, anyone up there, help. Somebody happens to be walking through the woods and say, oh, there's somebody down in that pit. And they take a rope and they throw the rope down and they help them up out of the pit. Huh? God reached down, changed the circumstances, and helped David out of those circumstances that he describes as a pit. God answered David's prayer. The power of God. Comments on this passage. He has the ability to get us out of the rough circumstances. He has the ability to do that. He has the power to do that. He can work circumstances out in just the right timing, and God can do anything. 
The Bible says, is anything impossible for the Lord? No. God will get you out of that pit. We cannot do it ourselves. We need to depend on his power to get us out of those rough circumstances. All right. I, I know I'm watching my time here. I, I really did something last week. I got it, we, it, one hour and two minutes last week. That was impressive. Yeah. The petrified platform, I know, kind of a silly, but he took my feet out. Uh, he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. So God reached down into that pit, took, took muddy, slippery, slimy uh, David. Did you ever try to pull a fish out of water? You know, it's, it's, it's on the hook. And you bring that line out, and there's that fish just kind of flopping, flopping, flopping. And you go to get it, and you got to get that hook out of its mouth. What a tricky situation, because that fish is slimy and slippery, and it's got a very sharp hook in its mouth. Many times what happens is you wind up with that, that hook in your finger, and the fish has slipped out of your hands and gone back into the, gone back into the water. Huh? David, uh, God reaches down, and he picks up slippery, slimy David, and he puts him on solid ground, on a solid rock where he's not in those circumstances anymore. What an answer to prayer. God gave him, we're making his steps secure. Life was back to normalcy again. A couple of things I want to say about this. Oh, I didn't. I, they're coming after this. Verse 6, or verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. David saw what, the God, what God had done. Now, first of all, you need to realize, David, we don't know how the circumstances went. Maybe there was an enemy that was closing in on him or whatever happened. There was a point. In fact, maybe that's when this was written. But there was a point when Saul was closing in on David. And David was on one side of the mountain, and Saul and his men were on the other side of the mountain, and Saul's men were catching David, and it didn't look good for David. And all of a sudden, a messenger came riding up to Saul's and Saul's army and says, hey, the uh, Philistines are attacking over here. And Saul says, okay, let's leave David. And he and his whole army left and went away. You know, all of a sudden... David's circumstances changed, and David was on a solid rock and was rescued. Huh? That could easily be when this was written. We don't know that. But um, David recognized that God had answered his prayer. You know, we miss that a lot of times. We're in some rough circumstances, and then all of a sudden something happens, and uh, this guy who is causing problems at work, he gets, he gets fired or laid off or moved, or something else happens, whatever. And then we, we look at the circumstances.